Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Pat Flynn Show. I hope you had a very Merry Christmas. It is presently the morning after Christmas, and it was a wonderful time here in the Flynn household. We had some family and friends over, and just, um, it was great. It was a perfect Christmas. Nothing too crazy, nothing too busy, just really... Um, a really awesome amount of quality time, family time, conversation, spending time with loved ones. It was a, a beautiful midnight mass with an incredible choir. It was it was just an A plus Christmas here. Uh, five stars, well, five stars all around for Christmas this year. I'm trying to adjust my chair. Sorry, just getting waking up um, after a very crazy day. All the eggnog went to my head, so just. Be patient with me as we ease into this episode. We're going to do a Q&A episode. I have a lot of questions in the, in the bank, and I want, to, I want to get through some of these for you because they're good questions. All the questions that everyone sends in are good. So if you want to join the conversation, then I invite you to comment below if you're on YouTube. Just at, even if you don't have a question, you could have a topic suggestion, or you could just say hi. Let me know. Let me know what you're up to. Let me know what you're. Let me know what you're drinking. That's always a favorite question I ask people on my email list. What's in your cup? I have. Um, I have. Um, what is this? This is pumpkin coffee. I'm not a big fan of flavored coffee, but there's this one brand called Cafe Fair. They are out of Madison, Wisconsin, which does a really nice job. I'm gonna take a sip. Try not to slurp too loud. Mmm. Oh my gosh, it's so good. There is nothing quite like that first sip of coffee in the morning. Now I'm a I'm very sensitive to caffeine. I'm not a big coffee drinker, but I always I always have my one morning cup of coffee. Okay, I'm going to quiet down and start answering your questions because that's what it's all about. Okay, first question comes from user Lanky T and he says, "Pat, I've been subbed for a while." Well, thank you very much. My question is specific to the windmill. In the kettlebell community, it is taught that your leg under the arm of the kettlebell should be the supporting, which should be supporting the weight, with the hamstring loaded as you hinge to the side of your body directly beneath the arm holding the bell. Feel free to correct me if I have described this wrong. My question is this: Those who do not train hard style kettlebells will often do the opposite, where they lock their leg opposite of the arm where it is being held and actually lean into the leg, not hinging with the leg underneath the weight. Um, is this wrong or is it just different? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, sorry for the paraphrase, but I think I understand your question. Uh, the kettlebell windmill is taught very in a very specific way within the hard style kettlebell community, that is correct. And it is often taught or seen differently outside of that, specifically what it's often contrasted with is a windmill that you might see in yoga. Um, no, it's not, it's not wrong. It is different. But I'll explain the difference. When we're doing the hard style kettlebell windmill, what we are actually doing is we're performing really two essential patterns. Uh, or we're, mo we're moving from the hips and the T-spine, right? It is hip hinge with thoracic rotation. And the reason... So, so your description was pretty, was pretty accurate. We do want the weight mostly on the back leg. And the reason is just because of, of distribution. If we're hinging, if we're pushing the weight properly back so that our hips are the primary mover in this exercise, not our low back, one, we're going to be stronger there. We're also going to be safer there. So part of it is performance. Part of it is safety. Again, these things are, are not at odds and, and very rarely should they ever be at odds. And, and so just by understanding that this is a hinging movement is naturally going to shift your weight towards that back leg if it's not there already. So it just, it just makes sense to set up to be ready for most, not all, but most of the leg to be, most of the weight, excuse me, to be on that rear foot. And then what we do is to kind of enter into the full windmill is as we're, I'm not going to, I can't stand up and show you right now, but I have a million videos of this on my channel. Um, as you're pushing the hips back, you are, you're, you're rotating. Uh, you're performing thoracic rotation. So we're not doing a, a lateral side bend, right? We're not just like curving at the low back. That's not what this type of windmill is. And again, to have that structural support to be as strong as we possibly can, it's the hip hinging plus the thoracic rotation that's going to allow us to really move the most weight and have the strongest possible windmill and keep us safe. Uh, you will get a stretch out of it, as anybody who's done the windmill before understands. You'll get a great uh, stretch in the T-spine. The, the rotation will really open you up, and you will get a great stretch in your hamstring. 
A yoga type of windmill is very different. We are in that type of windmill typically performing some type of lateral flexion. We're kind of doing something of a side bend. And again, not wrong. It's not, that's not the best way to load weight. Um, it's just not going to be as strong of a position. And that's why we don't typically teach the windmill that way when, when doing any type of heavy lift, because you'll probably, you might snap in half. It's just not a, it re- that is really more of a mobility exercise, a purely mobility or flexibility exercise, purely a stretch than it is move that we're going to really try to move any significant amount of weight with like the windmill. So that's the, that's the primary difference. And a key there is you see it in the Turkish getup. So when you're performing the Turkish getup, kind of see me raising my hand over head here at the podcast. Um, when you're in the, t- when you go from the, the, the part that everybody messes up, is what I'm trying to say, is when you swivel that back leg, you have to kind of visualize what I'm talking about here. When you swivel that back leg, right before you do that, you should be in a pseudo windmill position. Your hips should be hinged and it's the hips, not the low back that is powering that portion of the Turkish getup. And people sometimes make the mistake by, because they don't swivel that back leg, they can't hinge into the hips. And then it turns into this sort of weird, awkward side bend, which is a very weak and flimsy position. And this is where people often will really, uh, if they might hurt themselves because all the other positions are really strong. You can hold a lot of weight and then you kind of get into this really weak position and you're like, oh no, what am I going to do? If you do, bail and get out of the way. Don't hurt yourself to like safely evacuate the movement. But fundamentally, we need to learn to get that proper hip hinge uh, in both the get up and the windmill if you want to perform the movement as safely and as efficiently and effectively as possible. So there, good question. Uh, again, don't really get visual aids on the podcast, but I've got many, uh, many videos on the old YouTube channel if anyone wants to check out Cicada Bell Windmill. Let me have another sip of my coffee. Mm. Oh, it's so good. You guys don't usually get to experience the Pat Flynn coffee ecstasy because I typically don't record podcasts this early. And the reason I'm doing it is because in very little time, my children will be up and they will be right back with all of their obscenely loud and obnoxious Christmas toys. And that means any possibility of performing a podcast with, with any type of silence will be completely gone. Okay, next one comes from Will. Will Greer, Pat, can you talk about the forgotten virtues? Like prudence, which is my personal favorite. Will, you want luck, my friend. You are in luck. Because on Philosophy Friday, which I have, an, I have a new segment of Philosophy Friday coming out tomorrow. This will be one of the last ones we do in, in metaphysics and natural theology. Uh, we will probably take a turn uh, to ethics, to ethics and traditional natural law. Um, and those are kind of the two areas that I have specialized in in philosophy is metaphysics and natural law um, in the order of being and uh, natural traditional natural law the, the metaphysics of traditional natural law kind of stands upon two two pillars uh, we call it essentialism uh, you need a pillar of, of of essences and you need a pillar of aims or teleology and I'll, so there's there's so much there there's there's a it's a great philosophical intellectual tradition i believe it's true i think traditional natural law which in a way sort of developed out of virtue ethics of what Plato and Aristotle were getting at. So um, the, the virtues uh, and virtue ethics comes from, largely it's credited to Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, which if, if you haven't read Aristotle's ethics, everybody has to read Aristotle's ethics. Not once, you have to read it at least 12 times. Um, it is so rich and it is so nourishing and so correct. Um, it, should, it should be required reading and in, in, at least by high school for anybody. But I think, I think the, the study of ethics, I think ethics reached its height, its pinnacle with St. Thomas Aquinas in, the, in that sort of the traditional natural law. By the Enlightenment, the project just became an, an enormous mess, and it's still an enormous mess, largely. Um, we will talk about all that in Sunday School. I'll, I'll kind of go through a, a history of philosophy and ethics, uh, but then we'll also start to really unpack um, the philosophical tradition of, of uh, natural law, traditional natural law, which is contrasted with this so-called new natural law, which I think is kind of silly. Um, but as for virtues, virtues are, perfect, are, are habits or dispositions of our character. Um, Thomas Aquinas would describe virtues as a perfection of our powers, that within the nature of what we are as humans, we have certain powers or dispositions that it is good for us. It causes us to flourish as the kinds of things we are. 
to perfect these powers. And some of them are intellectual virtues, like you mentioned, prudence. And prudence is really practical good wisdom. It's using the experience and knowledge from the past to make the right good decision in the present for the right good decision in the future. So you can kind of think of prudence with three faces, one looking in the past, one looking in the present, and one looking to the future. That's what prudence is, practical good wisdom. And we often say that prudence is the chariot virtue. It's the virtue that helps us to cart around all the other virtues like temperance and fortitude and justice. So that way we understand what the right measure or means of action is in any particular circumstance to hit that golden mean, as Aristotle said. So, so the virtue is also kind of the golden mean would be that sweet middle spot between uh, excess or deficiency. So to take another example, courage is that, that appropriate um, action that is in the middle between either being cowardly or being reckless. That's what we mean by the golden mean, and that's, that's how Aristotle would describe virtue, uh, virtues. And prudence is the intellectual virtue that helps us to understand that circumstances often vary. Um, what might be courageous for person A in one circumstance might be very different than what is courageous for person B in another circumstance. It could be a courageous act for one person to storm into battle or to rush to defend somebody, but it could be a foolish act for another person, depending on the circumstances. That's what prudence is. Prudence is using that practical good wisdom gained through life experience, through study, um, through, through study of not just philosophy, but just human nature in general, circumstances, the, the times, um, and then trying to, trying to act in accordance with the natural law at any particular period in any certain circumstance. And, and this is, we all use or try to use prudence. We should try to use prudence in certain, in every situation. Um, for example, when, you know, when my kids do something wrong, I have to make a prudent decision. Okay, is this, is this offense punishable? How much should I punish this offense to try and make sure that they learn the right lesson from it, but also so they don't become resentful, right? So th there's, how do I apply justice? So it makes sure that it's actual justice and not just cruelty, right? How do I balance it with mercy? That's a, that's a prudential question so that my children learn the lesson. They learn it well. They don't become resentful of their father. They don't think dad's just being a mean guy trying to ruin their time on Christmas. I had to do this yesterday because things got a little out of hand at one point. And then other times it's like, okay, maybe I should just let it go at this point. It's not that big of a deal. Maybe I would tip the scales and, and, and they think that dad's just being a little mean. He's overreacting. These are all, these are all matters of prudence. And that's why and, – and prudence is – we're not saying that morality is relative. That's not what we're saying at all. There is an objective good that we are aiming at. But situations have relative contexts, right? What's, what's, what's prudent or courageous for a soldier – might be very different than what's prudent or courageous for, for, for me in my basement right now. Go figure. Um, so that's the idea, and this is why of the cardinal virtues. So St. Thomas Aquinas identifies four cardinal virtues that are sort of the super virtues where things, everything else falls out. Uh, I shouldn't call them the super virtues because there's also three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, or faith, um, hope, and charity. Uh, but in a theological sense, we believe those virtues are infused by God. They're, they're, they're acts of – we receive those primarily through grace. The cardinal virtues are things that we act to perfect on our own. And we have prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. And then certain other things, smaller categories fall out from under that. So that's just a, that's just a few opening remarks. That's what prudence is. It's extremely important that we should always be trying to reflect and study and 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 – try to find ways of being as prudent and possible in every situation to promote the, not just the flourishing of ourselves, but the flourishing of others, the attainment of the good. The good is the arrival of a perfection inherent to the nature of what something is. Um, so we are rational animals. We're meant to use our reason to discern what is really good for us. In a theological sense, we believe that that's the beatific vision, eternal friendship with God. Um, but, you know, sort of on approximate level, there's many different goods. And uh, philosophical contemplation, for example, is, is a good. Anyway, I don't want to dive too far into that. That's probably further than uh, we want to go on this episode. We will be taking um, uh, something, I'll be offering something of a mini course, just like we did in metaphysics, in uh, ethics and natural law. So if you're a regular listener to Philosophy Friday, I think you will enjoy it very much. So thanks for the question, Will. Okay, next one comes from uh, Dave McConnell. 
And he says, question, not that I want to limit myself to only one kettlebell exercise. In your opinion, what is the best kettlebell exercise for overall fitness? Thanks in advance. I know a lot of people will say the swing. I know a lot of other people will say the get up. I'm going to kind of cheat and I'm going to take a double kettlebell exercise. I'm going to say the double clean and press. And this should probably be no surprise to my listeners. You know I have a, a deep infatuation with the double clean and press. But let me tell you why. I think I can, I can justify this one. At least I can make a case for it. There's always good arguments to be made for other exercises as well. But if, if you had to restrict that, to taking one exercise to a deserted island, you know, that silly question that always comes up. But it's good. It makes you think. The double clean and press is great uh, because, it's it, it, first off, it works just about every major muscle group in the body. So uh, even the swing is going to let, leave some things, you know, not – not as well developed as other things, but the double clean and press is really good because we get a, we get an explosive hinging movement. We get this lower body power exercise, which is great. And with kettlebells, that's good because we can work more of the, the dynamic and explosive end of the force velocity spectrum uh, with kettlebells um, than the heavier grinding end. And that's just because kettlebells for lower body exercise, lower body hinging exercises, just they just honestly don't get that. They just don't get heavy enough. Like they're not going to be able to replace a barbell. So what do we do to increase strength? Well, we can either increase load or we can increase speed. We can try to be more explosive, powerful. So kettlebells really fit that function extremely well. That's why we love swings. That's why we love clean. So the double clean is like the Mac Daddy. Um, it's for me. It is the. It, it just. It's such a fantastic lower body and it is an upper body exercise too you get the biceps there you get the lats you get the rhomboids trying to control those that wily set of bell so you're getting hamstrings you're getting quads you're getting this explosive hip dominant exercise uh helping you to develop athletic power has a profound conditioning effect if you've done just sets of consecutive cleans especially heavier cleans you know that it really um can jack your heart rate up very quickly and then we transition into the just the, the raw, brute, upper body grinding press. To just hoisting too heavy object overhead. What could be more primitive, barbaric, and satisfying than that? I don't know. I can't really think of anything. So then we're going to get all that oh, upper body development, upper pecs, shoulders, still lats involved in there, traps, uh, core, tons of core in the military press as we try to stabilize the weight overhead. So we have the explosive movement. We have the grinding movement. We can train this exercise in a variety of ways. We can go lighter for more reps, get more of a conditioning effect. We can go really super heavy with it and just focus on pure strength. We can go in the middle. And this is a really good exercise for putting on muscle for hypertrophy. So for me, this is extremely versatile. It's extremely useful. That's why I feature it in so many of my workouts and programs. It just is a fantastic exercise. That's kind of maybe a cheap answer because it's kind of two exercises blended in one, and it's also using two kettlebells instead of one, but it's the answer I'm giving, so I hope it's satisfying. Thank you, Dave, for the awesome question. Okay, next one comes from Train Smarter. He says, on the workout side, how do you think variety fits in a training program? Should you stick to a particular routine and change it after a number of weeks? or vary it week to week. This is for general fitness, no particular goal. I have an easy, quick answer to this. I hope it is an unsatisfying. Variety for conditioning, consistency for strength and muscle. If you, if you want to get strong at something, if you want to get better at something, part of the reason we say strength is a skill is because you have to repeatedly practice that act. If you want to get good at pressing, you have to press. If you want to get good at dips, you have to perform dips. If you want to get good at squatting, you have to squat. So we need consistency for strength. We need to, we need to fine tune the system to perform a certain task. And we do that by, by programming it, by just repeating, uh, by the law of specificity and the law of, and, and progressive overload. Those are the two principles for strength specificity. You get good at what you practice, right? You're not going to get good at pull-ups unless you really practice pull-ups. Other things can help. There can be a slight carryover, but at the end of the day, we have to practice that thing we want to get good at. I'm not going to get great at the guitar, by just practicing the drums. I might learn certain basic principles of music, such as how to keep time that will eventually carry over, but just playing the drums will not make me a good guitarist. Same thing in exercise. Specificity matters, and consistency around specificity really matters. So if we want to get strong, we have to be consistent. Variety should be just specialized, like changing kind of certain angles or just finding slight variations in exercises to fill gaps, boost performance, et cetera. So specialized variety for strength. And then we need to make sure that we're increasing the challenge, you know, whether that's um, increasing overall load, 
volume, density, frequency, whatever it is, to make sure that we are giving our body the signal to adapt and to respond and grow. However, when it comes to conditioning, that's when the idea of variety can be a lot more helpful because when, we, when we're consistent, we become efficient at something. We become good at it. It's less challenging. But if the goal is to keep the body challenged, to keep the muscles fatigued, to, to just waste through calories, then we actually want inefficiency. We don't want to be super efficient at something. And that's where variety comes in. And that's where mixing things up, I think, is, is really useful and, and, and fun. It's, it's fun to mix things up. I get, I get why people fall into the variety trap because it can kind of be a little stale and boring to do a lot of the same things. So for me, it's a both end. We can have consistency and we need to have consistency for strength um, and, and certainly uh, 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 hypertrophy, muscle gain as well. Uh, but then when it comes to the conditioning element, that's mix things up, have fun, you know, do, do whatever that, do swim, do ballet, go outside, hike, handstands, whatever you want, frisbee. Frisbee golf, that's a big thing out here in Wisconsin, frisbee golf in the nicer weather. Come to Wisconsin and frisbee golf. I don't care, sprints. I'm big on um, just obstacle courses. Mix it up. Keep your body challenged in the conditioning sense. I think that's the easiest way to break it up. Um, hope that helps. Okay, next one comes from Jim P. He says, do you think someone has to be mean and muscular to succeed as a personal trainer? The answer there is absolutely not. Can it help on a superficial level? Sure, but I know many great personal trainers with a, a very successful career, a long track record of uh, successful clients, a booming business. Um, they're not winning any bodybuilding competitions. They're just great coaches. Uh, they're, they're in shape. You know, they, they, they're not like total hypocrites just teaching and preaching one thing and doing another. But they're not, they're not Hercules. I'm not Hercules, right? I'm in good shape. I'm, I'm lean. I keep a good amount of muscle on me. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it depends what you mean by mean and muscular. But I would say the general answer is no. I mean, the most thing is people, people care about themselves, right? They want to know what can you do for them. And if you have a solid system, a process, and a way of producing results for people predictably and repeatably and conveying that value, of, of, of showing it, the track record, most importantly, being able to show what you've done for other people, that's, that's going to do it. People are going to look at that and they're going to say, okay, this, 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 this person, they have a system. They seem to really care about their clients. They're not just uh, you know, showboating on Instagram with a, a, an endless number of, of selfies. And so like, you know, and I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. Of course, there's the, the, the Instagram gurus who just look fantastic. And because they look fantastic, People will just, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the Kim Kardashian thing. Like she could put out a fitness program uh, or a nutrition program and, and she'll, she'll make tons of money off of it. It's the celebrity effect. But I think kind of what you're saying is, do you need the celebrity effect? No, you don't need the celebrity effect. Will it help? Sure, you can get it. I'm not, Pat Flynn wouldn't turn it down. I hope it wouldn't, I hope it, I would still be a great coach, uh, but you don't need the celebrity effect to be uh, successful as a personal trainer. Absolutely not. And some of the, Best personal trainers I know who, who do really well in the industry. They have great careers. They've, they've met their financial goals, uh, um, have an awesome record of success. They're not celebrities. Most people don't even know who they are. Uh, so good question. Um, Sabrina says, would intermittent fasting protocols be different for women because of certain hormonal changes? The answer is, in general, um, intermittent fasting is and can be very effective for women, but the parameters are sometimes different than men, and studies have shown this. And uh, it really comes down to dosage, dosage, frequency, and intensity. So you know, whether you're uh, a man or a woman, I recommend uh, if, you're, if you're new to intermittent fasting, and I, we've covered this in more depth in previous episodes, so I will just point you to, in fact, like two weeks ago, we did a whole series on fasting and stuff like that. But here's a short of it. Um, think of it like exercise. Fasting is a challenge. It's a stimulus. And we want it to be a use stress, not a distress. We want it to be something that will cause us to positively adapt to become healthier, more energetic. Um, but like exercise, that's what we all want for exercise, right? We all know that exercise can be overdone, that people can train too frequently at too high of an intensity, and they can take what should otherwise be a positive stress. And they make it a negative stress. And then we start to see all kinds of problems. We start to see the effects of what's called overtraining, where we just kind of fall into this wretched state. We don't sleep well. We become very agitated. We might actually start to gain weight, gain those little pockets of belly fat and stuff like that. That's when we know that we're, we've 
we've passed the point of, of a reasonable dose, certainly past the point of a minimum effective dose. So approach fasting the same way. Start with trying to shoot for that minimum effective dose. Okay, what's going to be a way that I can introduce myself to intermittent fasting in a sensible way, um, start to kind of feel it out a little bit without overdoing it, without you know compounding stress unnecessarily. And uh, something like the 5-2 diet, I think, is a really good practical approach where just two days a week, maybe you skip breakfast, have a light lunch, and then have a normal dinner. Um, that's kind of a modified 5-2 diet. So all else equal, that's going to be awesome because you're going to be slashing a good number of calories from your diet in general. And that's fundamentally one of the primary reasons that fasting is effective for weight loss is because it just takes a chunk of calories and just chucks it out the window. Goodbye. Um, so, you know, but it's not, it's not, it's not crazy. It's not too intense. You're just two days a week, skip breakfast, maybe just have some coffee, a little, little delicious coffee. Mm, maybe like a light soup for lunch, you know, like a vegetable soup, you know, just something, just something light. It's got some volume. It will fill your stomach up. And then, you know, a, a clean, quote unquote, clean, healthy dinner, you know, protein, veggies, some complex carbs, if it's appropriate. And uh, there you go. And then, and then what I found with that is for a lot of people, and this works exceedingly well for many of my female clients, is that's enough. And then sometimes you don't even have to go anymore. Like that's enough to do the trick. And if you don't need to do these long extended fasts, you just don't need to do it. And what I've realized in fasting, people just want to kind of hop to the extreme. They want to just like, bring on all the intensity. And I would say that's as silly as somebody who's been sitting on the couch for 30 years and then just like thrust themselves into a CrossFit competition. Like you're just going to mess yourself up. That's not smart. And that's not to say that people can't do the CrossFit competition or can't do these really intense things, but generally the people who do and succeed at them have worked up to it. And same thing with intense nutrition protocols. Okay. Awesome. All right. Let's see if we could do like one or two more here. Next one comes from Train Smarter. Hey, isn't that the same guys before? That's right. I'm grabbing most of these from, from YouTube, by the way. So if you want to join the conversation, again, drop a comment in uh, here. Hi, hello, say hello. Suggestions are all welcome, either for these regular segments, Philosophy Friday or Sunday School. And um, I'll do my best to get around to them in a future episode. Um, cool. And if you're listening on an iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, Pat Flynn at chroniclesofstrength.com is my email, subject line podcast. All right, Train Smarter says, I actually would love to hear you and Dan talk about religion. I believe you're both Catholic. How have your religious views changed if you've gotten older? I think I heard you talk about your experience, and I would be interested in hearing more. So can't speak for Dan. He's not here, but I could try and bring this up um, to Dan in, uh, in a future episode. Uh, I'm sure he would have much to say. Dan, Dan's degree again, is actually not in fitness. It's, he's like me. We're degreed in areas other than fitness. His degrees are in um, history and theology. So he actually teaches comparative religions at St. Mary's. Uh, a lot of people don't know that interesting fact about Dan, but that's all I'll say about it. I'll let Dan speak for himself. We can uh, maybe do it. This would have been appropriate for a Christmas episode, wouldn't it? Um, how have my reviews, how have my, re yes, I am Catholic, by the way, you know, get, got the crucifix there and Got the Blessed Mother on the skateboard there. Um, isn't, that, isn't that a sweet skateboard? You guys want to see my skateboard? I'll bring the skateboard down um, maybe in a future episode. Um, so how have my religious views changed as I've gotten older? Well, I went from being an atheist to being religious. So I just became religious as I got older. And uh, I have covered this many times. This has been a theme of, of Sunday school. In fact, recently I was brought out to EWTN, which is that Catholic uh, channel usually the one that everyone skips by when they're trying to find something interesting to watch. But I'll be on that pretty soon. Um, I think my episode airs January 20th. It was on the Coming Home Network, and that's uh, where they talk to people who've converted to the faith. And it's an hour-long segment, and I got to sort of sh share my story. And mostly it was philosophical. You know, what, uh, what I've come to realize is a little philosophy, just like a little science can bring you away from God. When you really understand both, they just, they just bring you that much closer to God. And that was, that was it. You know, a little philosophy – Early on, studying some of the old atheists and existentialists made me a very skeptical person. But then as I tried to work out the naturalistic worldview, metaphysical naturalism, I just realized this, this can't possibly be true. It just can't possibly be true. For many reasons that I've argued in the philosophy segments of this episode. And then I went back to some of the classical thinkers, you know, starting with Plato, Aristotle, working up through Boethius, Augustine, Aquinas. And I was so impressed by St. Thomas Aquinas and the, Thomist, the, the Thomistic 
scholastic tradition, and especially so many contemporaries on the scene today, philosophers and philosophers of science, of seeing how much intellectual muscle and rigor was there. And so I, I first became attracted to the Catholic faith because philosophically, all these different lines of study that I, I, I felt were true kept pointing back or converging on the Catholic Church, whether it was metaphysical worldviews uh, or ethical, the traditional natural law. The Church has always been a staunch proponent and defender. Didn't invent the natural law. God did. <laughs> it's God's law. Uh, but it's always defended this as a, as, as, a, as a rich and correct philosophical, ethical tradition. So that always intrigued me about the Catholic faith. And um, but, so I, was kind of, I kind of became a Thomist before I became a Catholic. And I really just uh, studied for many years this, this philosophical tradition. I came to see this is correct. This is the correct way of viewing the world. Um, again, with metaphysically, um, it's essentialist. Things really do have powers inherent to them, uh, aims, dispositions. And this helped answer so many questions that I had been struggling with. And it was all consistently through so many great uh, Catholic thinkers, Catholic scientists, Catholic philosophers. I just was so impressed. And I just kind of kept shoving the religious question aside. And then one time, I, especially reading Aquinas, I mean, Aquinas, you know, people think of him as a philosopher and one of the greatest, if not the greatest philosophers. I would argue he was the smartest man that ever lived. I, I think, really think he was. Most everybody would put him in like the top five. I think he is number one. But he's also, he's fundamentally a theologian. And so, you know, to become Catholic, you have to think three things are true. You have to think that God exists, that Christ was and is God, and that God left us with a church, founded a church, a church that is visible, unified, hierarchical, sacramental. So that first part, I was there, right? Then I had to ask myself the questions about divine revelation. And the question of Christ and the resurrection becomes a lot more interesting, um, or depending on what your prior philosophical worldview is, is going to have a huge effect on how you view Christ and the resurrection. Because all Christ Christianity is a religion of miracles. There's no getting around it. Now, part of my objection to Christianity back when I was a skeptic was that I didn't think miracles were impossible because I didn't believe in God. Well, that, that problem has been removed because now I'm like, I'm, I'm a thoroughgoing theist, full on. So, you know, maybe I don't think miracles are happen or, or do happen, but now I have no a priori objection to their possibility. And then it's just a matter of looking at the facts on the ground, looking at the data. And here, taking a, a, a study historically of Christ and the rise of Christianity convinced me that it's true. Um, read read a, a simple accessible book would be something like The Case for Jesus by Brant Petrie. Really good. Makes the case for gospel reliability, at least on the essential facts that, that, that really kind of surround the resurrection uh, goes through your typical uh, naturalistic hypotheses, shows that they, they really cannot explain the data that needs to be explained. Um, and then also makes the robust theological case too, the fulfillment of prophecy, the confirmatory signs, which was always a, which was always a tradition in Christianity before the historical method came about. We're kind of in a privileged position now that we have access to, to the modern historical method. Most Christians didn't have that. So they, 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 they sort of, uh, secured the truth of their faith in, in other ways. In, in, uh, Aquinas gives befittingness arguments, uh, different philosophical arguments, confirmatory signs, miracles that happen in the church that continue to sort of tip us off or clue us in the direction that, yeah, this is you're like Marian apparitions is another big one, right? That, that really got me looking to Marian apparitions, looking to like Fatima and stuff like that. I'm like, wow, I think this really happened. Uh, were big signs. And then what made me Catholic was a study of the church fathers. Uh, fundamentally, not just scripture. I think you can make the, of course, I think you can make the arguments of scripture on this rock. I will build my church binding and loosing all that. I do think that that is Christ giving us a visible hierarchical authoritative church, but reading people like Clement, Ignatius, Irenaeus um, convinced me that, yeah, the Catholic church has claimed that it goes right back to the very beginning and has preserved those essential truths, the essential deposit of faith. I became convinced that was true. And then at that point, what else am I going to do? What else could I do? I had, I, had to, I had to convert. I had to become Catholic. So that's the condensed story. There's a lot there. And ever since then, I've just been trying to live it, you know, trying to live as, as, as best as I can um, the, the truths of, of the Catholic faith and in God's grace and, and, and be as, as charitable as I can to people. And it's, I mean, it's fundamentally trained my life inside out. The number of things that I have had to change about my decrepit, 
disgusting life when I converted are innumerable. I'm not even going to list them. It's too embarrassing. And I'm still working. I'm still a huge sinner. I fail every single day. Uh, but having the church there, having the sacraments of the church, the Eucharist confession um, have been utterly transformative, utterly transformative. And these were things I would have laughed at 10 years ago, we would have just absolutely laughed. So now I, I guess, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get on a tangent here, but if you ask how it's changed, what's changed is 10 years ago, if you would have told me I was doing any of this stuff, now I would have went to bed with a petrified diaphragm from laughing so hard. And now I'm not only uh, doing all this stuff, but so was my entire, my wife converted. She was never baptized. She just, she was baptized two years ago. She had her own kind of separate, separate path, but parallel path into the faith as, as, as I did. Uh, and it's been the single most important and fundamentally transformative aspect of my life, hands down. And there's such intellectual richness and rigor. And that's what really attracted me about the Catholic faith is it, it just it, more like initially it was the, philosoph the philosophers and the scientists who could answer questions that, that many of the secular uh, philosophers and scientists just uh, deeply unsatisfying and often incoherent. Um, anyway, good question. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm sure Dan has a lot to say on this and I will, I will try to reiterate this question for Dan, or maybe we can try and get Dan on an episode of Sunday school. I think that would be fun. Always happy to talk about it. Usually we reserve these topics for Sunday school, but whatever comes up in the Q and a comes up. All right, let's do one more here. Um, let's take this one from Sheffy boy. He says, Pat, I'd love to hear a segment on recovery days. What do you do for stretching, mobility, active rest, and how do you program it into a workout? Thanks, and keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Sheffy boy. I do appreciate it. What do I do? Um, a lot of my mobility um, has come from martial arts, uh, taekwondo specifically. So people, I often get a lot of compliments on my mobility. I have Pretty mobile. I'm a pretty mobile guy. I can I can get into some funky positions. Um, and martial arts was really helpful for that. Uh, and mobility is different than flexibility because mobility is strength and control through healthy, normal range of motion. Flexibility is just access to a range of motion, sometimes an extreme range of motion. So we really want to focus on mobility. We don't just want access. We want strength and control. So all of the movements in the and especially the kicks in Taekwondo really helped with my mobility, my hip mobility, hamstring, uh, just access. Uh, I was always a very stiff. I was the kid in, in middle school gym class that could never pass pretty much any of the tests aside from the sit-up test, which I talked about with Alex, but like the sit and reach test, forget it. So mobility is something I've had to work at, something I still have to work at. A um, couple things that I really like for mobility aside from martial arts, because I'm not going to just say go do Taekwondo, although I think that would be cool. And I think that would be really helpful for a lot of people. Um, it's talk about like a great conditioning element. And you know what? I, I will, I will recommend like if you can tie some other skill or interest into fitness, absolutely do so. Like definitely do so. Like why not? Like you, you want to go and fatigue the muscles and, and sweat and have a good time. Why not learn Taekwondo or martial art? Why not learn another skill on top? I've always found that, I mean, that's how I got into fitness was through Taekwondo. And, um, so yeah, I mean, if that's, if that's available to you, definitely take advantage of it. And again, it's another both and I don't just do Taekwondo. I don't just do weight training. It's the, it's the, the great both and it took me forever to get my black belt, but we got there. Perseverance, my friends. Mm. So I got my back black belt like three or four years ago. Um, and part of the reason is even though I started Taekwondo in early high school, I never, I never really tested. I just competed. So it was, uh, that's how I met Sam. For people who want another long, boring, and unnecessary story, Sam was my Taekwondo coach. He was a, the competitive uh, teams coach uh, when I was in college. Um, so I just spent so much time on the competitive aspect of Taekwondo, which was great. But it's very different than the sort of showy or technical form aspect where that's where you test. So once I got out of the competitive stuff, I was like, all right, no, maybe I should take this the belt progression seriously. And then I finally went. And, Got the black belt. Um, so yeah, okay. Um, other than that, crawling, great. If you want like big bang for your buck, get on the ground, crawl, and roll. It, like original strength stuff. Check out Tim Anderson. I love it. Uh, for programming, I just build it right in, especially into strong on. So for strong on, it's a high frequency approach to training. But some days are just purely recovery days. Some days are purely mobility days, and and they're always active. We're always doing something. So maybe we do some some light pressing get-ups. Light pressing get-ups are great mobility and recovery, just hitting so many different angles, 
making joints mobile where they need to be mobile, making joints stable where they need to be stable. I love that light bottoms up get ups are fantastic. We talked about windmills, lighter windmills, great mobility exercise, crawling, even just basic goblet squats, hip flexor stretch. It's just the fundamentals. Um, these are these those are some of the staples that are typically in my in my programming. So again, get ups, get varieties of get ups, varieties of windmills, crawling, a lot of good squatting, deep squatting work, squatting variations like Cossack squats. That's kind of pulled that in from Taekwondo background. Those were always very uh, helpful to me, especially for my my hamstrings. If I have a mobility weak spot, it's it is tight hamstrings, um, and it's just because I beat the crap out of them. You know, not just in martial arts, but also in kettlebells. So they, they always need a little tender, a little extra tender love. Um, and yeah, I said, and the original strength stuff, the rolling, the crawling, all that. And just the, the last thing I'll say that I think is really important is the walking. Get out and walk a ton. Walk as much as you can. Keeps body fat down, keeps you healthy, keeps you active. Uh, I love it just for uh, personal, like with my wife, like just getting out and walking with her, being able to catch up, talk about our day. Um, just, I think it's just great in and of that self. I always try to walk with somebody else, almost always my wife, but it's always good. And that's about it. Keep it simple. Do it often. And it's not an either or it's a both and. Okay, friends, that was a long episode, longer than I was intending. I got to go let the kids dive into their toys upstairs and whatnot. So, uh, Hey, thanks for, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoy these, uh, Q and a episodes, I welcome your questions. They're always great, great questions. So again, please help me out here. Uh, like the video, share the video, subscribe, ring the little bell, the likes, the subscribes, the bell rings, they all help and comment. Let me know questions or topics you want me to do discuss on a future episode, either this segment, Philosophy Friday, Sunday School. Um, love to hear from you, Pat Flynn at ChroniclesOfStrength.com or just comment on YouTube. And yeah, I got a Philosophy Friday, a sort of technical episode coming up tomorrow on a metaphysical, Thomistic, uh, existential Thomist uh, argument, I think. Yeah. So if you're if you're in a mood for some sort of dry technical philosophy, I'll be coming tomorrow. And I messed up the video. I have to apologize in advance because it was recording me, and then I had to f switch screens to go to my notes, and then it's just like a blank screen. So I'm sorry, it won't have the full video component, but you'll see my face at the beginning. Then we got Sunday school, lots of good stuff. I lo really love doing this podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. It means a lot. So if you could support the show by subscribing, liking, commenting, leaving those positive reviews really helps, and we'll talk to you soon.